Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Luke. The Gospel Record of Luke and chapter number 4. The Gospel Record of Luke and chapter number 4. We have been going through this gospel record, and of course we're going to be in it for quite a while. And we've already spoke about Jesus Christ's conception, his birth. We've seen as he's grown up. We saw on Sunday morning the baptism of Jesus Christ, the marking of Jesus Christ starting his public ministry. We talked about the lineage of Jesus through the line of Mary and saw that God knew what he was doing. But now as we transfer back, the rest of the gospel records immediately immediately have the uh, baptism of Jesus Christ immediately followed by this wilderness wandering, by this time of Jesus in the wilderness, that as he now publicly announced himself, immediately God brings him back. And remember, there was a purpose for it, the purpose of obedience, that as he's fixing to start, he has the proof, the evidence that he's willing to be obedient as he is guided by God's Spirit. So with that in mind, turn with me to the Gospel record of Luke in chapter number 4. The Gospel record of Luke in chapter number 4, and notice with me if you don't mind in verse number 1. The Gospel record of Luke chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible says this, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this glory will I give thee, and the glory of them for that which is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark it a very important phrase that we find in the Gospel record of Luke chapter number 4. The Gospel record of Luke chapter 4 and verse number 1, notice this. It says, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse number or chapter 4, verse 1, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come up to you, we're just asking that you would give us grace and mercy. Give us an understanding as we open up the Bible even now that we can see this important event and that we can understand the significance, the importance, and why God had this listed for us. Why is God revealing the curtain about what's happening in Jesus Christ and that we could take the application to our own lives because of this? Fill me with your spirit now that we could 
be a blessing to your people, that they could be encouraged, that they could respond properly, and that they can have the grace they need in the times that they need it. Again, you do a work today that only you can do, that by the time we walk out of here, we'd be recharged, we'd be energized, we'd be strengthened, we'd be determined to give you the glory in all situations. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin, we have to start off with a setting. So let's see this, the setting of the temptation. The setting of the temptation. Notice with me in verse number 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. So speaking about the baptism, his public baptism. And was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The time, the place, and the circumstances of the Lord's temptation were all chosen by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one who set this up. The Holy Spirit set up the time when he was to go. The Holy Spirit set up the place where he was going to go. The Holy Spirit set up the circumstances. Do you know that God knows what he's doing? And that he can set up in your life times, circumstances, and situations, places that he chooses to do a work in your life. Now, the Lord had returned from his baptism filled with the Spirit. And as he's filled, that means that he surrendered. Now, we know that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. As we go with the gospel record of Luke, we see that Jesus Christ was the perfect man. And being the perfect man, the perfect man is not strong in himself, but depended upon God. <laughs> And that's what Jesus is illustrating. That even though he's God, he yielded himself to the Spirit's control. That the Holy Spirit led him as an example to us. That we are to be led by the Spirit, dead to self. Now, at this time and situation, Satan had dealt with sinful men. Now, think about sinful man and compare to Satan. To Satan, all these sinful men were pushovers. It is very easy to get a sinful man to mess up. It is very easy to get a sinful man to murmur and complain. It is very easy for a um, sinful man, for Satan to put enough pressure on him to complain. We understand that. In fact, most of us have been there. But now this is different. Because he's not dealing with a sinful man. He's dealing with God. And Satan knew this was God. Here was a man anointed of God, filled with the Spirit, and absolutely without sin. And so it begins. The site of the temptation was the wilderness. Now when we speak about wilderness, just as a clarification, it's not talking about some forest wilderness that some people talk about. This wilderness is a desert. A desert's a place where there's no rainfall. Out there, it is rocky, no vegetation. Out in the wilderness, if you can imagine, just uh, tons of sand, tons of dunes, a lot of nothing. No water, no substance. But you know one thing that it did have, according to the gospel record of Mark? Wild animals, wild beasts. Now, what are you thinking about? Scorpions. Rattlesnakes. Do you know that there was lions in that area? Lions are deadly. There are animals out there that are made to survive the desert. And they're looking for any prey. And think about some guy by himself. Hungry. Weakened. Do you think the wild beast would think he was easy prey? And the Bible speaks about that was part of it too. So the sight of it's the wilderness. The circumstances is that he doesn't have a lot of anything. No water, no food, no substance. It wasn't a vacation. He didn't have a nice little umbrella on the beach and the sands and just kind of take a 40-day vacation. Every day was difficult to the flesh. Every day was tiring. Every day was miserable to the flesh. You could imagine you be out there. Again, forgive my personal illustration. 
I remember there was a time in the military that um, we had a plane crash go down in the middle of the Gila Desert in Arizona near Yuma. And it was out in the middle of the desert so far, there was no roads. We had to make our own roads to get to where the plane was. And it was 120 degrees. We have to wear our military uniform. And we're out there. There's no bathrooms, no fast food, no water fountains, nothing. It was miserable. And I was out there for, for um, uh, it was an all-day thing from morning to night. And by the way, Arizona desert, morning's very, very early and night is very, very late. It's hot. You say, why are you saying this? Well, I was an assistant to the pastor at the time and I was pulled out. And one of our church folks was also out there. And uh, next Sunday morning, this was Saturday, uh, next Sunday morning, the man came up to me and said, you know, I, uh, when I was told that I was going to pick up plane parts, I was really disappointed. I was like, it was horrible. Then I found out you were going. And I said, you know, you're going to be happy and you're going to keep us going. But you know, I was so disappointed to find that you were as complaining as everyone else and as miserable of everyone else. That hit. By the way, that was one day out in the desert. Jesus is out there for 40. No food, no hotel room, no tent. Out there. Miserable. Sand. I don't know if you've ever served anywhere in a sand. Wisconsin doesn't have a lot of sand. Sand gets everywhere. In the military and the desert places where we served, you could take a shower and immediately you got sand all over again. It's there. Same thing with this. Sand is everywhere. Sand gets in your clothes. It gets <laughs> rubs in the clothes against your skin. It's miserable. I'm trying to paint the picture that this wasn't just 40 days of holiday. This is 40 days where his flesh is being as mis- made as miserable as possible. And Jesus is there. The place surrounding it was depressing. It was barren, isolated. Now again, y'all up in Wisconsin, you're used to trees, you're used to green, you're used to other things. Could you imagine being somewhere brown, no color, everything's the same beige, nothing there? So you're not getting any encouragement from anything. Even the sky's beige. The wild beast is there. His Body is weak from fasting for 40 days. 40 days with no food. You remember those old commercials that they used to have for Snickers that they would have some grumpy celebrity or something and they're interacting, you know, some old lady playing football or whatnot and they finally give them a Snickers bar and say, you know, you're always a different person when you're hungry. And isn't that true? You let us be hungry and we could get grumpy pretty quick. You let someone go without sleep And you can get grumpy pretty quick. You go ahead and weaken them up. Let them feel pain. Let them feel miserable. And they can get grumpy pretty quick. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points that we were tempted. You know, it's easy to say someone won't fail when their surroundings are good and everything's good in their life. But at the same time, we usually give people a pass And say it's very easy to see someone who gives in to temptation when they're weak. So Jesus Christ, in order to show it can be done, allowed himself to be at the place where his flesh, his body were irritated, tired, hungry, weak, threatened, burned, miserable, nothing there to be redeeming. For 40 days to prove you don't have to be grumpy. And you don't have to give in to temptation. And you don't have to quit. And by the way, you don't have an excuse to allow your circumstances to determine your joy. Now when you look at it that light and you see this is what it is. He went through the roughest conditions to prove You don't have to be grumpy just because something miserable happens to you. You don't have to give in to temptation and murmuring just because things are not as favorable as you want them to be. Remember, when we start getting weak, 
we start giving passes and excusing ourselves for being grumpy, for us not being spiritual, for us not being right with God. And we don't have that permission because Jesus Christ was our example. Now, in the midst of this, Satan did not come and present himself until the 40 days, until Jesus was at his weakest point. I mean, how many of you get grumpy just because you don't eat supper? 40 days. You know how weak you get after not eating for so long? Do you know how things, your mind begins to get muddled and it's hard to think when you're tired? And you know how easy it is just to go and least resistance and just make life miserable and everyone else because you're miserable? He waited until, Satan waited until the pinnacle of the weakness the ultimate thing where he was as irritated as irritated is going to get. And that's where Satan came to tempt him in his weakest moment. Remember, the temptation of Jesus Christ did not happen when Jesus is strong, when he's victorious, when he's already seen things. It was a temptation when he was at his weakest, his tiredest, his most threatened. Everything was down. So let's go over the temptations. The first temptation, dealing with the will of God. The first temptation, dealing with the will of God. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number two. And being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. Notice this. Jesus Christ, who was God, robed in flesh, he hungered. You understand, he is 100% God, but he's 100% man on purpose. So that way we can't say, well, you don't know what it's like to be hungry. You're God. He was in the flesh or in a body, physical body, and he knew what it was to hunger. You know hunger, when your stomach is twisting inside and growling at you. You know hunger when you get to the place where you haven't eaten in a while and your body is physically weak? He was hungered. It wasn't just that he was hungry. He was hungered. He was at the place where he has nothing to sustain him physically. Notice as it goes on. Verse 3. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. So Satan follows that same weakness. He's hungry. If you're hungry, what would you do to satisfy that hunger? I mean, you would do what you could to get something to eat. If it was made available, if you can make a trade. Think about Esau. He was hungered and he traded his whole birthright just for a bowl of chili. Here's Jesus, 40 days without eating. And Satan says, why don't you take this stone and make it a bread? You understand this was certainly within the power of Christ. He could have done it. He absolutely, he could have ended his hunger right then and not suffered anymore. That weakness of giving in to temptation just because he was hungry, you could have made it. Notice what Jesus did. Verse 4. And Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every Word of God. Now what's the implication in here? Jesus answers from the word of God, but he gives this answer that man was supposed to be sustained by God's will for their life. That's what should sustain you. Food is important, but it's the will of God that sustains us. Are you following the will of God? Are you living with what God has given you to do? It was God's will for Satan, for Jesus to go through this temptation. If he would have changed this stone into a bread, it would have ended God's will and God's desire for his life at that moment. Does that make sense? God desired him to go through it. Didn't the Holy Spirit lead him out there? Wasn't that his circumstances? Absolutely. This is what God had for Jesus at this point in time. And though he had the power to do so, to do so would bypass what God's will was for him. God's will was more important than satisfying a fleshly hunger. Now we're not saying that the eating is not important. 
But at this moment, it was not God's will for him to eat. And God's will was more important. Jesus would stop his fast when God told him to stop. He said, I'm going to let God determine what I do. I'm going to be obedient to him. What he says is what I'll do. I want everything in my life, even to the food. Now, with that, there was a thing. Didn't God have more of a purpose for Jesus? Yes. So isn't it logical that God would not allow Jesus to starve? See, God knows what he's doing. We can trust him. And that we may be going through a circumstance and we may feel weak and we are wondering why I'd do anything not to go through this. I would do anything not to feel this way. I would do anything. But you understand that God has a purpose for you? And he will take care of it in his timing? It may not be our timing, but his timing's perfect. Can we trust his will? This is what's being implied. That man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, we're understanding Bible reading is important, but you know what the Bible's telling us? What God's will is for us. That God's will is more important than sustaining and feeding our fleshly needs. Now, I didn't say once. I said needs. God's will is more important. And if God has a purpose, he will take care of us. He will know what he's doing. That's the first temptation to see if he was, Jesus was willing to bend on God's will. Now, part of this miracle here is that if Jesus took care of it, he would be using his power just to feed a personal need. God had sent Jesus here to feed the needs of the world, not his needs. And so he was showing that we're, he was here to take care of the, the world. We get so selfish sometimes that we forget that God has a purpose for things that we go through for the purpose of reaching others. We just sometimes go, why is God doing this to me? Why do I have to go through here? I'm so miserable. By the way, that's our flesh. That's our flesh looking at us. God knows what he's doing. So now we come to the second temptation. The first temptation was dealing with the will of God. The second temptation deals with the worship of God. The worship of God. Now this is big. Notice with me in verse number 5. Then the devil taking him, Jesus, up to a high mountain. Now by the way, an amazing thing is happening here. It's called teleportation. My personal opinion. He's in the desert. Now all of a sudden he's in a high mountain. By the way, soon he's going to teleport to the city of Jerusalem just like that. Satan can't be everywhere at once, but he is pretty quick. Notice if you don't mind verse 5. And the devil, taking him, Jesus, up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms. Notice this. Notice this. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Do you know what happened here? That Satan was able to take Jesus up into a mountain and say, look at all of the kingdoms of the world. Not just right now, but look at all the kingdoms of the world everywhere in this one point of time. Meaning, he's able to take all the kingdoms that happen, all the things, and bring it and say, look, look at all of them in the world. All of them. Verse 6, and the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and glory for them, for this deliver, that is delivered unto me, to whomsoever I will give it. Now let's pause. Do you know who's the ruler of this earth right now? Devil is. The Bible's clear on that. Satan's the boss. Doesn't it feel like it sometimes? Now, God is the God of the universe, but God has allowed Satan to have power on this earth. Sometimes people say, why is our world turning apart? Well, guess who's in charge? Now, God's directly in charge, but God has a purpose for this. Now, notice what Satan's willing to do. Satan says, all of this, the kingdoms of the world, in a moment of time, I'm showing you this. I'm willing to give it to you, right here and now. I'm willing to give up. Now, notice what this is going to entail. Jesus Christ knows that he is born to die. And Jesus Christ knows how he's going to die. It's not just going to be a simple death. It's not going to be a quick death. It is going to be one of the most painful deaths in all of history. You see, most people were just crucified. When people were crucified, they were not beaten like Jesus was. They were crucified. 
Jesus had several death sentences all placed in his body at once and put up on the cross. He suffered like nobody else did. And by the way, it was not fun to have a cat of nine tails that had nine straps to it and have hooks and then every time one of them would hit your back, it would slice into your skin and slice it open so someone could take their finger and touch the bone. That is not a pleasant experience. It hurts. The Roman soldiers took their fist and... and um, made them fist and hit him in the face. His face was so swollen, you couldn't even tell he was a man anymore. That doesn't feel good. They took his beard and they jerked it out. And when he did, pieces of flesh came out with a beard. It, you know, you, your hair likes to stay in your body if it can. And they pulled out his beard. Chunks of flesh came out. That was not a pleasant experience. Now, if you knew that you were going to be in the most intense pain ever. That pain scale when the doctor says, you know, what pain level do you have? One to 10. It was a 10 plus. The worst pain you could imagine. And you knew you were going to go to it. When you do almost anything to avoid that fate, Jesus knew that his disciples were going to betray him. They all took off. Peter's denying Jesus. That hurts. Everyone abandoned him. And then the worst thing ever is that God, for that moment of time, turned his back on his son. And we don't know what it's like to have God's presence removed. And Jesus knew he was going to go through here. And so Satan gave Jesus a legitimate, honest offer. I give up control. I let you win. I will no longer fight for you. You can have all of these kingdoms without dying. You can have all the people in here without having to die for them. I surrender. You win. That sounds like a pretty good deal so far. If I don't have to go through pain, if I don't have to go through suffering, if I don't, what kind of deal is this? All you have to do is just one time. Just one time. Not permanent, not forever. One time. If thou will worship me, all shall be thine. Do you know that this is an honest, honest, no manipulations, no strings attached, an honest effort, an honest trade Satan was willing to give. He was willing to give up everything right then and there. If God, robed in flesh, would worship him just once. That's all Satan wanted. That's all he wanted was just once. By the way, that's all Satan has ever wanted since his fall from heaven in the Garden of Eden. That's all he ever wanted was one time for God to acknowledge how great he was. Just once. How many people are willing to give up to avoid pain? To compromise? Just to avoid some heartbreak? To avoid a confrontation they don't want to confront with. To avoid getting someone mad at them. They're willing to compromise and not obey God. Just to avoid a hard time. Do you think that was a temptation in the flesh of Jesus Christ? Now I'm not saying that Jesus would ever consider that. But you understand he is all points tempted as we are. If you knew that you were going to go through intense pain... Would it be worth it for you to go through it anyways? By the way, that's why God doesn't tell us before we get in a car accident and go through things. Because we would say no every time. Weak, pathetic humans. But here Jesus has the opportunity to avoid everything. And Satan give up the war immediately and forever. All he had to do was just one time. No one else is looking. There's no one there. One time. Worship Satan. Notice what Jesus' response was. Verse number 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind thee, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall they serve. Jesus went and told Satan, Nope, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Jesus came back. And just said the word of God. God says, the Bible says only God's to be worshipped. I have to obey the Bible. 
Even if that means that I have to go through some hard times. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to worship God. Even if that means that I have to suffer because of it. I'm going to obey God. Even if it's going to cause me pain and heartache. Because God is the only one to be worshipped. I cannot avoid the pain. Just (laughs) if the exchange is not to worship God. Now think about that. How quickly are we willing to sell out everyone not to hurt anymore? How quickly are we willing not to obey God and to turn away from God, not to hurt anymore? How many times people left from church and stopped going to church altogether because they don't want to hurt no more? You know, now I understand people may hurt you, but God has never failed you. Why quit on God? Some people quit reading their Bible because, oh, life is just too hard. And, you know, I remember dealing with a guy again, forgive the personal illustration. I was dealing with Satanists for a while and trying to have a ministry to Wiccans and I was talking to a man once and he said, you know, after his bravado and him saying he was powerful and whatnot, he said, you know, I became a Christian. I'd accepted Christ as my Savior. And he said, an amazing thing that when I tried to serve God, I honestly tried to serve God, life got harder. And I found that when I stopped serving God, things eased up. Well, I tried to serve God more and life got harder. And so I stopped, eased up and life got easier. And finally I got to the place where I said, if this is easier, I don't have to go through things not to serve God. Then I give up. I'm not going to serve God so I can have an easier life. And next thing you know, he found himself in a Satanist church. Worshipping the devil and all kinds of awful things that happened. And he just started crying. He says, I failed God and I messed up. Just because I didn't want to go through hard times. That's exactly the temptation Jesus is going through. How many times were easy. Well, I don't want to read my Bible. Because I don't feel like it today. How many times. What does it get you to do to stop serving and worshipping God? The threat of pain, the ease. Well, I will feel better if I just use my mind to relax and watch TV rather than read the Bible today. So easy. We're willing to go for relief rather than take the time to serve God anyways. Remember, Jesus is hurting. Jesus is hungry. Jesus is miserable. Jesus has been threatened. He's physically in danger. And now Satan is prompting him. With an honest, Jesus knew Satan enough to know if this was an honest reply or not. This was honest. No, I cannot give up worshiping God, even if it costs me physical pain. And thus we go to the third temptation. We had the first temptation, the will of God. The second temptation dealt with the worship of God. The third temptation dealt with the word of God. Notice with me in verse number 9. And he, Satan, brought him, Jesus, to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Now, here's the situation. They're in the desert. Poof! They're in a mountain. Poof! Now they're in the city of Jerusalem. And as they're sitting in Jerusalem, they're on the tallest mountain in Jerusalem, on top of the tallest building, the uh, the temple. Now, for those of you who don't like heights, could you imagine that? All of a sudden, poof, you're standing and you're looking, and you're looking down these hills, you're on the tallest mountain, looking down on the tallest building and seeing all of Jerusalem. Looking down and seeing the mountain fall off, that there's a little mountain peak between the temple mount, Mount Olivets. They have the Kidron Valley. And so you're looking down off this and looking into the valley. Seeing the heights. And you're there. And Satan brings him here. And said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written. Now Satan knows your, his Bible better than you. Satan knows the Bible better than you. He starts quoting scripture. And he said, For it is written, He shall give his charge over thee. His angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands... They shall bear thee up, lest any time they dash thy foot on a stone. Satan says, how about this? Let's take a shortcut. You're going to go take the long path. Let's shortcut it. Jump. And we know that the Bible says that God's going to protect his little precious baby boy. 
God's going to keep you and protect you. So you go ahead and jump from the highest height. Everyone's going to see you. And guess what? Before you hit the ground, these angels are going to come. And they're going to keep you from falling. And everyone's going to see it. And everyone's going to know that you came from God. All these angels. There's going to be evidence. No one can have any doubt who you are. He says, the Bible says it. Now let's go with the scripture. You kept quoting scripture. This is what the Bible says. Okay. What do you do with that? Well, the problem is, is that Satan had taken the verse, tore it from its context and rest it. This comes from a promise found in Psalm 91. Satan conveniently left out the words, He shall keep his angels charge over thee to keep thee, notice this, in all thy ways. Whose ways? God's ways. You understand, according to the context here, that as long as Jesus was in the will of God, God will keep uh, Jesus. But if he jumped off it, he would be going outside of God's will. What was God's will for him? To go and be three years where he's, everyone's doubting. Is this the word of God? Is this the son of God? Is he really God? Is he not God? They could have raced all doubt and had a supernatural display. But he says, nope. I have to be in God's will. I have to keep to what the word of God says. Not what I wanted to say. I can't twist the scriptures. Now notice what Jesus answers in verse 12. And Jesus answering and said unto him. It is said that thou shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Meaning that this idea of temptation is going outside of God's word. And presuming on his grace. That's what the word presuming. The Bible speaks about keep me from presumptuous sin. What is a presumptuous sin? It's any time that I purposely and knowingly sin against God. And presume that God is not going to punish me for it. That's pretty big. This presumption here that Satan w was making. You go ahead and jump off and God will protect you. Well if Jesus jumped off and made a public display... Well, that's trying to say, well, God's going to protect me no matter what I do. No matter what stupid thing I do. Well, it's as long as it's in his way. This is important. Satan took out some words of scripture and twisted it to try to get his word accomplished. Now, we have to be careful. We have to line up with the Bible at all times. And line up with his will at all times. Now, interesting enough... All three of these passages Jesus quoted from was from Deuteronomy. Jesus knew and quoted Deuteronomy. I guess that's a good book to read and study after all. It's neither here nor there, but some people say the laws of Moses are boring. Well, Jesus used this law, the three different passages here, to defend himself from the books of Moses, book of Deuteronomy. You should know all the scriptures and know what they say. Now, what do we learn from this? Well, Jesus Christ was our perfect example. And he was tempted in all points as we were tempted. And he was without sin. Now, our life, we have hungers. We have pain. We have inconvenience. We have irritations. But none of that allows us the permission to give in to temptation. To give in to take a shortcut. To give in and not serve God even though it may seem like it's too hard. Jesus was our perfect example here. And we pretty much get rid of all the excuses. Again, we are pretty understanding and pretty sympathetic. Well, that person's grumpy over there and we got to understand they're going through a hard time. Why do we have to understand? Why do we give permission and allowance for us to be grumpy just because we're hurting? Why do we give permission for us to hurt people because we are hurting? If we're going to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, we, even though we're weak, hungry, pain, suffering, it does not give us permission to go outside from trusting God's will. Now, what was Jesus trusting in the whole time? By the way, let me underscore this. You can't do this yourself. You do it yourself, you are going to fail every time. And we've done that. How many times have you failed? Raise your hand if you've ever failed in a temptation. 
If I had more hands, I'd raise them. <laughs> we can't do this of ourselves. You are not strong enough. Your flesh is not strong enough. You can't do it. But God can. This is what being filled with the Spirit is about. Being dead to self. Allowing God to have control. Being filled with the Spirit and controlled by the Spirit. And being filled with God's Word. These are the two things that get us through hard times. These are the things that get us through pain. By the way, those are the two things we don't want when we're hurting. We don't want to be dead to self. We want to baby that flesh. I'm sorry that you're hurting. What can I do to make it? Right? Don't you baby yourself when you hurt? Oh, come on. It's all white. What can I do to make it feel better? A greasy red lobster? Well, I know I can't afford it, but red lobster, it make you feel better? Okay. Or is that just me? Okay. Don't. Isn't it easier to go shopping, bin shopping, when you're hurting and not feeling good? Just to make yourself feel better? Go to Amazon and... I mean, Go shopping and then get all these packages show up that you really didn't need. Why in the world did you need this alarm clock that went, hey, we look cute. I mean, don't we make stupid purposes? Don't we go out and eat too much at fast food and stuff when we're hurting? Or go to Quick Trip and I'm tired. Oh, look, they got a special on sandwiches. I think I'll get four. I, We, we do things to baby our flesh. Oh, well, I don't want to feel pain no more, so I'm just going to zone out in the TV and watch something so I could forget about things. And we do that when we need to be dead to self, filled with God's Spirit, controlled by God's Spirit, and filled with God's Word. That's the only way we will survive temptation in a way that's pleasing to God that could be a help to us others. You see, the choice is take care of ourself or be used of God to help others. Now, Jesus was our example. He was in all points tempted as we were. So again, speaking to a bunch of failures, by a failure, I'm trying to say you can't do it. But God can. And Jesus gave us the example of how to be done. Even though he was hurting, hungry, irritated, Threatened, tempted, being filled with the Spirit, which means dead to self, and letting God be in control, and being filled with God's Word. You know, how much you read of God's Word is really going to determine your spiritual strength when those times come. Have you been filling yourself with God's Word? Are you spiritually strong or spiritually weak? God can help you. And understand, as the Bible talks about in the book of Peter, when you go through diverse troubles, happy are ye! God has a plan. You can trust Him. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.